Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. Pakistan's controversial blasphemy laws lead to violence and chaos. Baloch activists call for unity against China Park Alliance at 5th International Conference. And Pakistan's disruption tactics fail as election commence in Jammu and Kashmir. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, a country teetering on the brink as blasphemy laws plunge into chaos and violence. The brutal murder of a doctor accused of blasphemy exemplifies a system where due process is a mere illusion. Instead of protecting its citizens, the state fuels radicalization and mob justice, celebrating those who commit violence. As fear grips the country, Pakistan's reputation as a failed state deepens, leaving countless lives shattered and the rule of law in tatters, a report. These troubling visuals of a police van set ablaze by an aggressive mob, along with their acts of vandalism, symbolize a broader crisis. Pakistan is engulfed in the flames of radicalization, a situation sanctioned by the state itself. This environment of chaos has led many to label the country as failed and doomed. A tragic incident underscoring this turmoil occurred on September 19th, when a doctor named Shah Nawaz Shah was brutally murdered in Umarkot Sindh after being accused of sharing blasphemous posts on social media. He had previously been charged under the harsh Section 295C of the Pakistan Penal Code, which carries the death penalty for alleged blasphemy against Prophet Muhammad. The accusation was followed by major unrest as extremists took to the streets and staged a violent demonstration. Reports and disturbing images indicate that Dr. Shah Nawaz was killed by Sindh police and his body was later taken to the civil hospital. This staged killing raises serious concerns about the misuse of blasphemy laws in Pakistan. Just days before his death, on September 17th, Dr. Shah Nawaz was ordered to report to the health department in Karachi after being suspended from his position at the district headquarters hospital due to public outrage. The order highlighted a strong presumption that he had shared blasphemous content online. In a video released prior to the incident, Dr. Shah Nawaz explained that hackers had posted the offensive material on his inactive account. Instead of launching a thorough investigation, authorities opted for a swift and unjust execution, reflecting a disturbing trend where blasphemy accusations are weaponized to silence individuals without evidence or due process. The fact that the policeman involved in his murder was celebrated with flowers further illustrates the depths of Pakistan's societal decline. Blasphemy laws have traditionally existed for one reason and one reason alone, which is uh, political. Uh, uh, and very frequently personal as well. In uh, uh, medieval Europe, because, you know, the lending of money, uh, usury as it's called, was not allowed, uh, Jews used to be the target of every uh, uh, sort of blood libel rumor uh, uh, by a, uh, a debtor who could not repay his debt. Uh, today, you know, it's, uh, it's a slightly different dynamic, but very similar. It's usually politically motivated in some form or the other. Uh, where uh, you want to hide your own uh, culpability. Earlier in a troubling incident in Balochistan's Quetta, a policeman allegedly killed a man who was in custody on blasphemy charges. The issue of blasphemy in Pakistan is fraught with tension and has led to numerous acts of violence and murder. One of the most significant events was the assassination of Punjab Governor Salman Tasir in 2011 by his own bodyguard, Mumtaz Qadri. Tasir had publicly criticized the blasphemy laws and advocated for reform, which ultimately cost him his life. Following the assassination, Qadri was hailed as a martyr by certain segments of society. 
Another prominent case involved Asya Bibi, a Christian woman accused of blasphemy after a disagreement with neighbors. She spent nearly 10 years on death row before her acquittal in 2018. This case sparked widespread protests and unrest, culminating in the murder of her lawyer Shahbaz Bhatti, a Christian minister in 2011. Additionally, the 2017 lynching of Mashal Khan, a university student at Abdul Wali Khan University, underscored the perils of mob justice surrounding blasphemy accusations. His brutal murder highlighted the extreme volatility and dangers inherent in such allegations. Pakistan, remember, is fundamentally a feudal agrarian society that in most uh, parts still exists in the 7th or the 11th century. And oh, the characteristic of that society is, uh, you know, the spreading of gossip and rumors followed by large lynch mobs that target religious establishments, usually for some kind of political or personal reason, but uh, masked up as uh, religious whatever. So it's not very surprising uh, uh, what has happened out there. The blasphemy laws in Pakistan have fostered a culture of fear and intolerance. Many individuals accused of blasphemy face violent reprisals, often without due process. Reports indicate that the laws disproportionately affect religious minorities such as Hindus, Christians and Ahmadis. These events underscored the severe consequences of the blasphemy allegations in Pakistan, illustrating the intersection of religion, law and social dynamics. The Baloch National Movement held its fifth international conference in Geneva to draw attention to the ongoing human rights abuses in Balochistan. Speakers, including BNM Chairman Nasim Baloch, stressed the importance of unity among marginalized communities advocating for autonomy. They condemned the oppressive actions of both Pakistan and China, particularly against the Baloch people and Uyghur Muslims, and urged for ongoing efforts to expose these violations. The conference called for increased advocacy to support liberation movements in Balochistan, Xinjiang and other affected regions. Take a look. The Baloch National Movement launched the 5th Balochistan International Conference in Geneva, coinciding with the 57th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The event was part of a series of activities organized by the BNM to highlight the ongoing human rights abuses in Balochistan and draw international focus to the region's political situation. The conference featured speeches by notable human rights activists, political figures and legal experts who addressed a wide array of concerns regarding the human rights violations in Balochistan. Following the conclusion of the event, Baloch activists emphasized the key issues discussed during the event. BNM Chairman Naseem Baloch emphasized the importance of the conference, which brought together representatives from various communities, including Sindhis, Kashmiris, Pashtuns, and Uyghurs. He highlighted the shared struggles for autonomy in their regions and expressed a strong desire to unite these groups. 
Additionally, Baloch emphasized the roles of both Pakistan and China in these violations. Today's conference, we have seen the Pakistan or China policies that are affected by the Taliban. We have seen the Sindhi, Pashto, Kashmiri, and Egur Muslims bhi hamare saath the jinhone Balochistan aur Pashtunistan Sindhu desh aur East Turkestan ki jo movement hai us pe ek achhe tarike se baat ki hai duniya ko aazadi dene ki koshish ki hai ye hamari ek balki ek koshish bhi hai ki ye ye tamam aqwam unite ho kar متحد ہو کر چائنا اور پاکستان کے خلاف ایک اتحاد بنائیں تاکہ ہم ان مظالم جو مظالم ہم پہ ڈائے جا رہے ہیں پاکستان چائنا الائنس کے ذریعے ان کا ہم ایک طاقت کے ذریعے ایک متحد فورم کے ذریعے اس کا مقابلہ کر سکیں اور ان مظالم سے اور اس اکوپیشن سے جلدی چھٹکارہ پائیں Baloch activists condemned China's role in Balochistan, accusing it of exploiting the region's natural resources through strategic projects which they claimed have exacerbated the oppression of the Baloch people. At the conference, Baloch activists urged for unity in opposing the China-Pakistan alliance. Basically, the objective of uh, this uh, a uh, conference was to shade uh, highlight uh, ongoing uh, human rights violations in Balochistan uh, as uh, previously uh, the human rights violations were only done by Pakistan but this time as we feel uh, China is part of uh, this violations helping out Pakistan to do human rights violations so the event was a very successful event uh, from all around the world different uh, people came and they participated The China-Pakistan alliance, often framed as a strategic partnership, has significant implications for human rights in both countries, particularly in regions like Balochistan and Xinjiang. In Balochistan, the Baloch people face systematic repression, including enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, and restrictions on freedom of speech and assembly. The Pakistani military and paramilitary forces have been accused of targeting dissenters and activists, leading to a climate of fear. In Xinjiang, the Chinese government has been accused of perpetrating widespread human rights abuses against the Uyghur population and other Muslim minorities. Reports from human rights organizations detail mass internment camps where over a million Uyghurs and others are allegedly detained without trial. Moving on, as the first phase of elections in the Kashmir Valley commenced, the atmosphere was vibrant and hopeful in stark contrast to the narratives pushed by Pakistan and its affiliates. Days before voting, security forces engaged in a crucial encounter in Baramula, eliminating three terrorists and showcasing their commitment to maintaining peace. This proactive action highlighted the challenges posed by terrorism to the democratic process. As India invests in the region's development, Pakistan's support for violence aims to disrupt this progress. Take a look. As the first phase of elections unfolded in the Kashmir Valley, the atmosphere was not only politically charged, but also economically dynamic, presenting a stark contrast to the narratives propagated by Pakistan and its affiliated terrorist organizations. This development posed significant challenges for these groups, which thrive on instability and unrest. The elections represented a crucial milestone in the political empowerment of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, allowing them to participate actively in shaping their governance and future. However, Pakistan made concerted efforts to disrupt this democratic process in India's union territory. In a preemptive move, 
security forces engaged in an encounter with terrorists in Baramula just days before the elections. This confrontation, which took place in the Patan area of the Northern Kashmir district, resulted in the elimination of three terrorists. The gunfight erupted when a joint team of the army and local police, acting on reliable intelligence, launched a cordon and search operation in the region. The successful operation not only neutralized the immediate threat, but also underscored the commitment of security forces to maintain peace and order during this pivotal electoral period. The operation continued into the morning when our troops, in a very professional manner, engaged the terrorists and neutralized them without causing any collateral damage to civilian life or property. In this operation, a total of three hardcore terrorists were neutralized and a large quantity of warlike stores were recovered. As India invests in infrastructure, healthcare and education in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan perceives these developments as a direct challenge to its baseless claims over the region, which it views as integral to its national identity and political narrative. In response to these perceived threats, Pakistan has supported and facilitated various terror groups operating in Jammu and Kashmir. This cycle of violence driven by Pakistan's frustrations with India's development efforts has created significant obstacles to the peace process. According to reports, several terror groups run training camps in areas like Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, where individuals receive training for armed conflict, especially targeted at India. But the truth is, Pakistan never stopped using POJK as a launch pad, as a training center, as in a hideout for the terrorists. It never dismantled the infrastructure that is required uh, to promote terrorism and export to India. The acts of terrorism have not only disrupted stability, but also complicated diplomatic dialogue between the two countries. However, India has consistently and effectively countered these acts of terrorism, employing a robust security response while simultaneously emphasizing its commitment to development and democratic governance in the region. Pakistan is clearly rattled by the success of abrogation of Article 370 and 35A in Jammu and Kashmir, as the number of tourists has been increasing phenomenally every year since 2019. Also, with peace and prosperity setting in Jammu and Kashmir and the number of terrorist incidents going down pre-2019 clearly show that the Indian government did a wise step by abrogating Article 370 and 35A. Hence, Pakistan is leaving no, un no stone unturned now to foment more trouble in Jammu and Kashmir as it is not able to digest the peace and prosperity that is settling down in Jammu and Kashmir. The Kashmir issue is central to Pakistan's national narrative and is often used to rally domestic support. By portraying itself as the protector of Kashmiri rights, Pakistan seeks to assert its influence in South Asia and maintain its standing on the global stage. This intricate relationship between identity and politics influences Pakistan's strategy towards Kashmir and underlies its support for terrorist actions. On the other hand, India is dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for the Kashmiri people, presenting a stark contrast to Pakistan's support for terrorism, which is seen as a destabilizing force. India's focus on development, infrastructure, and community well-being underscores its commitment to fostering peace and stability in the region. The UN is urgently calling for coordinated international aid efforts in Afghanistan, where millions face dire humanitarian challenges, including widespread poverty and food insecurity. 
With the 2024 Afghanistan Humanitarian Response Plan only 30% funded, the crisis is poised to worsen without increased support. Concerns over human rights violations under the Taliban, particularly affecting women and marginalized groups, have led to a significant decline in aid. A report. The humanitarian landscape in Afghanistan is marked by widespread poverty, food insecurity and lack of access to essential services such as healthcare and education. Many families are struggling to meet their basic needs with reports indicating that millions are on the brink of famine. Moreover, the restricted international engagement has led to a lack of oversight and coordination in humanitarian efforts further complicating the delivery of aid. UN officials have therefore called for a renewed commitment from the international community to support humanitarian programs in Afghanistan, stressing that without adequate funding and cooperation, the crisis will deepen, potentially leading to widespread suffering and instability. I'm greatly concerned that 2024 Afghanistan Humanitarian Response Plan is only 30% funded, with around $900 million received of the $3 billion required. The world's limited engagement with Afghanistan is primarily driven by concerns over human rights violations and the treatment of women under the current regime. This reluctance has resulted in a significant decline in aid reaching those in need. As international support diminishes, many humanitarian organizations struggle to provide essential services, worsening the already critical situation for millions of Afghans. Recently, Slovenia's Minister of Foreign and European Affairs chaired a Security Council debate in New York that focused on the deteriorating situation for women and girls in Afghanistan. In a joint press statement, she emphasized that the systematic and comprehensive nature of the restrictions on the rights of women and girls may constitute gender persecution and must stop immediately. Afghan women play an indispensable role in ensuring the prospect for a peaceful, stable, prosperous and inclusive Afghanistan, including the country's long-term development. However, since their takeover, the Taliban adopted numerous measures targeting women and girls and severely restricting their full, equal, meaningful and safe participation in all spheres of economic, cultural, social, political and public life. We are counting more than 1,100 days of continued repression and human rights abuses against women and girls across the country. The Taliban's unwillingness to engage with the international community has resulted in widespread and systematic human rights violations, particularly against women and marginalized groups. Their refusal to listen to global concerns and adhere to basic human rights standards has led to increased oppression within Afghanistan. This disregard for international norms has severe consequences for the Afghan population who are already suffering from the impact of decades of conflict. Many people are cut off from access to essential services such as healthcare, education and economic opportunities. The ongoing human rights abuses contribute to a climate of fear and uncertainty, leaving millions vulnerable and marginalized. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Akansha signing off on behalf of the entire team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.